Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum here at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. Uh, I would like to welcome our online live stream audiences and those of you who watch later. Um, the Commonwealth Club has done over 700 programs since the pandemic started, bringing them authors and other speakers to um, the online world uh, instead of doing our live audiences here in San Francisco as we used to. So uh, the first thing for tonight is that we have a great author, Sebastian Junger, with us. He is uh, the bestseller of A Perfect Storm, um, A Death in Belmont, Tribe, and uh, Freedom, plus uh, five or six other books. Also is a movie uh, uh, creator, uh, Restrepo, um, from his experiences there. So, uh, Sebastian, welcome to the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, even though you're coming digitally to us. Hey, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, our pleasure. Um, so, in your book, Freedom, you use the framework of walking down in the wilds of Pennsylvania for then talking about a lot of different times in history as what we do about the idea of freedom. So how did you get this idea and, uh, to, to, to do this travel? I mean, I know you've done a lot of uh, yeah. backpacking, all that kind of stuff before, but... Yeah, well, many years ago, actually, before I knew I would be writing a book about freedom, um, I'd been in a lot of combat overseas. I'd been a war reporter for a long time. Um, and I came to a point in my life where I thought that that really needed to end. I'd lost a good friend in combat and mm -hmm. that uh, changed a lot of things in my mind. And, and so I set out from Washington, D.C., actually, with a few other guys who'd also been in a lot of combat, a couple of vets and another journalist. And we walked along the railroad lines uh, from Washington, D.C. To, to Philadelphia, up the East Coast, and then we turned west at Philly. Instead of going to New York the way we'd intended, we turned west at Philly and, and, and headed west mm -hmm. and wound up sort of on the outskirts of Pittsburgh. We picked the railroad lines because they're the, it's, they're, they're the sort of swaths of no man's land that, that just crisscross America. And you can kind of do what you want out there. I mean, it's illegal to be on them, uh, mm -hmm. but they're also not really monitored. And... You know, if you're conscious of the trains, frankly, cars on the roadway are a lot more dangerous than trains are on a train track. And mm -hmm. it's a sort of wild environment. You know, we were sleeping under bridges and in abandoned buildings and cooking over fires and getting our water out of creeks and dodging the police and other people that might have not meant us well. And uh, we made our way for about 400 miles off and on for a year and mm -hmm. uh, in every season. And uh, as I say in the book, uh, most nights we were the only people in the world who knew where we were and and that that is um, there are many definitions of freedom. But but surely that's one of them. Yeah. You use that as one of your first uh, definitions of freedom. Nobody else in the world knows where you are. Um, there are a lot of people that escape that way from whatever their lives are, um, try to disappear, at least to know that all the people who knew, used to know them don't know them anymore and can't yeah. find them. Um, so that's another form of freedom, but, but yours was another, another step further than that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we live in a very advanced, uh, sophisticated society. And usually when people talk about freedom, they really often, um, are thinking of more conceptual levels, more political levels, more moral levels, maybe even psychological levels, you know, sort of an inner freedom or what mm -hmm. have you. Um, but, you know, I, the thing I wanted to make clear from the outset in my book and probably in this talk as well is that we are, you know, we are a species we're the we're, we're, humans are a species. We're animals. We're social primates. Mm -hmm. And a very important part of freedom is is actually very physical. Right. You are physically unconstrained by others who are more powerful you, that you're you're out of their reach, you're out of their sight, and maybe they don't even know where you, where you are. And, and that has been the key for insurgencies and uh, um, uh, re, you know, war refugees and people who have escaped from prison mm -hmm. and escaped slaves and all kinds of people, good and bad. It's been the, been the way that they have maintained their autonomy is to simply move fast, keep behind cover, move under cover of darkness and uh, and avoid the authorities. And that's what we were doing, although, of course, we, you know, we, we weren't wanted in any other sense, except that we were, you know, breaking the no trespassing laws on the railroad right away. Do you think that this will become harder to keep accomplishing as, as time goes on in 50 years from now? I mean, you, you can throw away your cell phone, but otherwise, you're probably going to know exactly where everybody is all the time. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, and, and, you know, we, 
we were anonymous out there and unlocatable for very short periods of time. I mean, it would be very hard to sort of live your life out there. You know, I, I for what it's worth, I have a flip phone. I don't have a smartphone. Uh-huh. I don't, I'm not sure how precisely I can be located. Certainly my, you know, my buying history isn't on my phone or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. I don't have Google maps on my phone. So I guess you could triangulate me if you really needed to, but otherwise I, you know, I, 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 um, I think that one of the great um, factors reducing our, our our freedom in the sense that, you know, we, if you if the government has a lot of oversight over you, a lot of information about your private life, if corporations have a lot of information about your private decisions, it, it doesn't mean necessarily that you're not free, but you're in a vulnerable position where you could easily lose your freedom. Mm-hmm. And so for me, that's one of the arguments against the sort of prevent pervasiveness of social media. You know, we're getting there. There are many ills that come from social media and the the risk to your privacy uh, and ultimately your freedom is one of them. Yeah, we had a speaker here maybe two or three years ago uh, that mentioned in the Ukrainian revolution um, that uh, the the Orange Revolution, there was a time when people were protesting in the main square and everybody's cell phone went off at the same time. And it was from the security service saying, we know you're there. Yeah. We, we, yeah, we know you're you're in the square protesting, you know, as a as a statement to every phone that they could locate in that area. I thought that was right. a pro, right. you know, harbinger of the future, you know. Well, yeah. And, you know, the the, the guys who invaded our, our nation's capital on January 6th, a lot of those guys were caught. A lot of those people were caught because they were able to geolocate the phone phones, uh, you know, within within that building during that time period. So mm-hmm. apparently. Uh, so, yeah. And. So I just, you know, just to just to comment that when you use the convenience of those devices, one of the things you're doing is is opening yourself up to the potential for government scrutiny or corporate scrutiny. And if you're worried about uh, I mean, I'm I'm sort of slightly mocking the the current day rhetoric in America. But if you're worried about your quote, your freedoms, Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things you may do may want to do is take your. take your smartphone and walk down to the nearest uh, lake or pond and see how many skips you can get out of it before it sinks to, <laughs> sinks to the bottom. Um, one of the, the details that you had was you took your dog with you on this walk. Um, and, and of course, it's a really long walk. I don't know how many miles you did in one day, but how, how far could your dog walk with you in a day? Did it slow you down or was he, would, he, would he have stayed ahead of you? Oh, she was, uh, it was a she, uh, uh-huh. I, I, you know, the, I mean, I went once went bicycling with my dog on a, on a pretty cool day and it was a three mile, you know, three miles to the beach, right. Rolling, uh-huh. you know, exactly three miles, rolling, rolling hills. And we, <laughs> we did, we covered the distance in nine minutes. She uh-huh. ran three, three minute miles. Right. Yeah. So no, they're, they're completely superior beings. <laughs> Dogs are in a, in a physical sense, they're designed to cover ground, except when it's really hot. And yeah. that's one one area where humans really have this amazing advantage um, is that we don't have, you know, we don't basically don't uh, don't have hair. I mean, we don't have fur, rather. Right. And we can sweat through our pores and we can cool ourselves off in very high heat. And, and, and as a result, humans can outrun almost any mammal uh, in, in hot weather. And, and that includes horses. I mean, I mm-hmm. looked at some of the ra- the uh, times there's a race, an amazing, brutal race called mm-hmm. the Western States 100. In the Sierra Nevada, it's 100 miles. I can't remember how many feet of elevation gain. It's just inhuman what the what they're doing. And and uh, the winning time was you know around 14 hours, mm-hmm. and which which was faster than all but one horse in the entire history of the race, because uh-huh. uh, they also run uh, horse and rider teams on basically the same course. So mm-hmm. so the ability for humans to outrun other animals in in uh, is is extraordinary. They just can't. They don't do very well at shorter distances. But so Daisy, our dog, you know, we're walking along with 60, 70 pounds on our back. We're walking three miles an hour, maybe four uh-huh. at the maximum. Uh, she could do that. I mean, she could have done that for 48 hours straight. I mean, uh-huh. she I mean, she was fine. Yeah, great. <laughs> so you're, you're taking this trip. One of the fun things that you said was, you know, you, you can always avoid uh, attention because especially at night because you see the headlights coming. So why don't you explain the kind of dodging uh, the, the local uh, communities and stuff as you moved along? Yeah. So, you know, basically we were trespassing and, and, and train engineers, if they spotted us, would call us in. So if we heard a train coming, 
we would step into the underbrush mm -hmm. and uh, we got very good, very, we got sort of very dialed into our environment. We would hear trains coming. I think even before we were technically hearing them, I think we would sort of feel them. I don't know what it was we were picking up, but we'd sort of look at each other like, do you feel something coming? Mm -hmm. And it would, and it would be a train a mile off. And I don't know what it was that maybe the rails were vibrating in some mm -hmm. way that we could feel. I don't know. But at any rate, we got very good at knowing when something was coming. The passenger trains came really fast and those were harder to avoid. You know, they're going 120 miles an hour. Sometimes mm -hmm. the freight trains are about 60, 60 mm -hmm. miles an hour. And, and uh, so we would uh, step into the underbrush. Sometimes there was nowhere to hide. And sometimes the engineers would call us in and then we'd have to sort of avoid the cops. And, but that wasn't that hard to do. And, and, you know, I remember one time the cops were really looking for us. We barely managed to sort of like, get off the tracks before they went by in their patrol car. And, uh, and so we stayed off the tracks until it got dark. And we realized is that at dark, um, everything on there, everything on the railroad lines has to have a headlight on it. The trains, the patrol cars, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. And you can see those lights, you know, a mile away because the tracks usually are quite straight. Mm -hmm. And that gave us plenty of time to sort of get out, out of the cone of light um, long before they, anyone could see us, you know, into the darkness of the weeds and the underbrush. And, and so, you know, we realized that if we needed to, if people were looking for us and we needed to move, we, we could move at night and it was all but foolproof. Did you have a story all set for this? I mean, like, like if you did have to talk to the police, you say, I'm, but I'm Sebastian Younger, I'm doing research <laughs> for a book. I mean, did the whole, the whole team of the other guys say, say you've got to be the one that does the talking or? <laughs> you know, what, once we walked up onto a commuter rail platform uh, uh, north of Baltimore and, um, it, or, I'm sorry, south of Baltimore, and it was, um, it was the station, the Amtrak station that, that serves uh, BWI Airport. And uh, we, we walked right up, sort of right up onto it out of the woods. And there happened to be a cop there, mm -hmm. an Amtrak cop. And uh, <laughs> he was a very nice guy. And, and we actually have footage of it. I made a documentary film called The Last Patrol about this trip. And we mm -hmm. have footage of it because we had a, 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 a camera mounted on Daisy's back, a, a GoPro <laughs> mounted on Daisy's back. So Daisy filmed him. And he was a very nice guy. And it, it was like, you guys can't do this. You can't be doing this. Like, you cannot walk on the tracks. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, and he said, and I can't, you know, he said, honestly, there's nothing I can do about, I, I can't arrest you guys because I'm, he said, I don't have radio contact here. So <laughs> which I was surprised he told us. And, uh, so, uh, it was all sort of a gentleman's agreement. I was like, all right. I was like, okay, no problem. You know? And, uh, you know, of course we got right back on the tracks after we, mm -hmm. you know, we boxed around that area and got back on the track. So he was a very nice guy and I hope the film didn't wind him up in any kind of trouble with Amtrak because really, he was a very, very nice guy. How about the towns along the way? You stopped, obviously, to get food and stuff like that. I mean, did you ever walk into a town and, and the, the people say, you know, who are these people? You didn't come in a car, you know. I mean, yeah. they probably would have no. noticed, you know, who, who, who are these people, right? Yeah, I mean, we had a dog, you know, I had the daisy tied to my backpack when we were in a town and we all smelled the wood smoke and sweat and yeah. we looked like hell. And uh, you know, we'd go, we'd stop at a store and get a pack of cigarettes and some food and whatever, or maybe we'd go to a diner and have some like real diner coffee and pancakes. And yeah. then we keep walking and walk back out on the railroad lines and keep walking. And we did that every few days. And that people were, people were really nice. You know, we were friendly guys, right? Two of us are, were vets. Right. And that has a lot of currency, uh, particularly in the sort of areas, the rural areas where we were walking. And most of the people, mo most of the men we met were actually, you know, vets or their sons were vets or you know, whatever, like mm -hmm. the, it, 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 that sort of helped a lot. And um, people were pretty OK with it. Uh, and, you know, I got to say, like, Americans are good people. They're nice people. Like, I mean, I sort of fell in love with my country, you know, and I got mm -hmm. whatever. I got some criticisms of us, you know, policy wise, of course, whatever. But but as a nation um, and these are, you know, I'm a, I'm a voting Democrat. We're walking through areas that are, I would say mostly like MAGA red Republican, right? Mm -hmm. And did not matter. Like they were really, really good people. And I, and I would like to think if they were doing the opposite, mm -hmm. walking through an area that was, you know, a blue state like Massachusetts, where I'm from, I would like to think that they would discover the same thing. And I, mm -hmm. and I sort of have hopes that our country will, you know, on a larger scale, sort of figure that out for ourselves. <laughs> Yeah, I think the way that the country by the media is divided in, in this way is, is inaccurate anyway, because the, most of the states that are supposed to be one way or another, it's, it's really only a 
60 40 split or a 55 yeah. 50, 45 split. So it's not like we're really divided and, 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 and not really a nation anymore, even though there's plenty of people yeah. who say you want California and Massachusetts to join Canada, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, one of the things when you were out there, did you think about, because if you just went back, um, say, 150 years when they were building those railroads, did you imagine at all what it must have been like to go through the total wilderness and build a railroad through it you know, and, and decide yeah. where to put it, all those kind of things? Did that ever cross your mind while you're out there? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I really liked about the railroad lines is that it goes through the middle of everything, right? Mm -hmm. So it goes through right through the ghettos, the cities, the industrial wasteland, the suburbs, mm -hmm. uh, the farms, and the wilderness. And, and there were times in Pennsylvania, you know, we hit Philadelphia and turned west, and a lot of our uh, trek through Pennsylvania was along the Juniata River. Mm -hmm. And the Juniata, that means um, standing stone in the native language of that area, because because there was a huge standing stone in the, in the town of the present day town of Huntington, mm -hmm. uh, a carved standing stone, 50, 15 feet high, something like that. And when the whites got there, when the settlers got there, it disappeared. The, the natives carried it off somehow. No one knows how mm -hmm. and no one knows where they took it or where they put it, mm -hmm. but they moved it. And but at any rate, the Juniata River gets its name from that. And it's the only east west trending river in Pennsylvania. And it cuts through the um, Allegheny Mountains. And uh, so it was a transit corridor, mobility corridor for wildlife, for the natives of that area for thousands of years, for the settlers. The settlers were following the Indian trails. The, um, the railroads eventually followed the, 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 the settlers' roads. Um, and then eventually the, the highways followed the railroads. And mm -hmm. so we were in some areas. So we, you know, we were walking along this ancient mobility corridor along the railroad tracks, and it's really wild out there. I mean, the Juniata, you, you leave Harrisburg and you step through the Juniata, Mount, the Juniata River Gap mm -hmm. and through Blue Mountain, and you're in this wild place. And I got to say, it was pretty intoxicating. Like, we could do whatever we wanted. There was firewood everywhere. We could sleep basically wherever we wanted. We got plenty of fresh drinking water. Uh, it was April, but we swam in the river. It was freezing cold, but really, we were, like, free to do whatever we wanted. We moved fast, and... Um, you know, it really felt kind of primordial. And there were, but there were also, there's a lot of gunfire, right? There, there were just Pennsylvanians own guns and they mm -hmm. like to shoot them. It's it, it sort of, <laughs> you know, we'd all been in, in a lot of war, right? And it yeah. sort of felt like a, there was a low grade insurgency going on around us. It was pretty <laughs> extraordinary. And, um, uh, but there, we passed a sign, you know, this is back in 20, 2013, okay? Mm -hmm. We passed a sign saying, uh, nailed to a tree, saying this is private property. And we, the, the occupants, the, the federal authorities are not allowed here. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the occupants, I'm paraphrasing, but the, the residents will use any means nece necessary to maintain their, their privacy and their freedom. Wow. It was a warning to federal authorities that basically that you'll get shot at if you come onto this property. Yeah. And that was just a one day walk out, two day walk outside of Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we were sort of bumping up against this sort of like this thing in America right now, this antipathy towards the federal government and this sort of this debate about how, you know, how much autonomy can a, a, a citizen actually declare from the federal government. And, and, uh, and it was just sort of interesting, but, you know, to answer your question, the the railroads were enormously costly to build. I mean, financially, mm -hmm. but also in terms of of human lives. Mm -hmm. um, there, it was incredibly dangerous. You had armies of of, of loggers with axes felling trees, and then uh, you know pulling the roots out with teams of oxen, and and uh, and then laying the track bed. And I mean, just thousands, tens of thousands of people working. Um, almost like indentured servants. Mm -hmm. And they died by the hundreds, by the thousands, mm -hmm. putting railroad line across the continent. Uh, it was, uh, I, mean, you know, I mean, they were dying so fast that the, that the railroad companies didn't even bother keeping records of the deaths. They just buried them and moved on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when people say, why do things take so long now? Um, you know, what, what, with all these safety regulations, a little bit of history would be useful. Um, some of the bridges yep. in New York also, uh, when they went in like Brooklyn Bridge, you know, the earlier ones also resulted in plenty of deaths um, for the people putting it together. So um, 
you talk about freedom as a concept now. You've been doing it just in your reaction to the, the wilderness. Um, one of the things that you talk about is obedience, that, that uh, obedience is something people avoid in order to, to, to be free. But it's interesting because obedience has always been considered something of a virtue, uh, at least by leaders of society. And so we, we, we have this uh, contrary idea about obedience. Obviously, we don't want chaos, uh, but we don't want to be obedient either. So why don't you talk about that spectrum and how you reacted to it? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, society is this sort of like has this dynamic tension between the, the interests of the individual to pursue their own goals, to, to serve themselves, their own interests, um, and the sort of interests of the group of society. And here's the thing, like humans do not survive alone in nature. They die immediately. Mm -hmm. Humans survive and they, they in fact thrive. Um because they work in groups. We're social primates. Mm -hmm. We're collaborative. We're cooperative. Um, one of the interesting things about humans, unlike our closest animal relatives, chimpanzees, is that actually we are not, we're not, the society is not dominated by a single alpha male that really does demand obedience, mm -hmm. right? In the state that humans existed in for most of human history, the last couple of hundred thousand years, uh, until the until the advent of agriculture, small groups of hunter gatherers, 30, 40 individuals um, were, were fairly egalitarian. And, and the reason for this is that ev all, everyone in the group had the skills to survive for a while on their own. And so it was very hard to sort of like enforce discipline on, say, an extended family that didn't want to, quote, obey mm -hmm. like that extended family could could leave and take up with, you know, the, the, the wife's cousins or whatever and some other, you know, when some other group, like there was a lot of mobility. And so leadership was was given from below rather than imposed from above. Mm -hmm. um, it was collaborative. And um, that changed with agriculture. Once you had agriculture about 10,000 years ago, you could amass a lot of food. There was they started to use monetary instruments. You could pay for a huge standing army and that army could be used to defend the state, um, but also to oppress the the, the citizens. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that's very, very hard to do in a hunter-gatherer society, a small-scale organic society. So, so really, you know, what you're talking about is to what degree do the individuals agree to abide by group norms? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we all live in a society, right? A society, we're completely dependent in, a, in North America. We're completely dependent on the supply chain, which is overseen by a federal government mm -hmm. um, uh, for our food, our shelter, uh, our transportation, our medicine. I mean, everything that keeps us alive, we are individuals are completely dependent on society to provide those things, but for a few exceptions. I mean, I guess some people grow all their own food, hunt mm -hmm. their own food, build their own build their own lodgings, but even they don't do their own surgery, you know, yeah, or, what, or right, right, whatever. Right. <laughs> so, so, um, so the, 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 the conundrum that humans are in is that if you put yourself outside of society into the wilderness, as the early settlers did in Pennsylvania in the 1700s, you are definitely beyond the reach of government authority of sort of social order and of the church, mm -hmm. uh, you were in the wilderness. It ha the wilderness happened to be occupied by native peoples who mm. really, for the most part, did not want you there. Right. <laughs> uh, but even without them, the wilderness is an extremely dangerous place. And if you are collaborating with others, other settlers, you're 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 way better off. You're much you're you're much safer. And so, what the early settlers found was that they had an they had an enormous freedom out there, but their lives were at risk. Uh, unless they collaborated with others and in a kind of mutual defense pact. So when there were Indian raids along the frontier, the settlers would gather at these sort of hastily built stockades and defend them to the last person mm -hmm. uh, because the, the, there was no real option of sort of surrendering. People would be tortured and, and, and killed and, and, and abducted and turned into um, and enslaved often. So, so the, 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 the arrangement was that the settlers had this enormous freedom but they had to abide by the, expe the, the expectations of their neighbors, of the community, that they would help defend to the last man, to the last person uh, during an Indian attack. And if you were not willing to do that, 
and particularly as an adult male, if you were not worried, if you were not willing to carry a, a rifle and a tomahawk and a scalping knife at all times so that you could defend the community on, on a moment's notice, if you were not willing to do that and basically fight to the, to the death to defend the community, if you weren't willing, you were not wanted. You were basically cast out. So these mm-hmm. people were trading uh, allegiance and uh, and loyalty and obedience from uh, to one thing, trading it for another. They're trading mm-hmm. obedience to a large scale government to obedience to a local community. And, you know, arguably the local community actually would put in, in place more strictures. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were, these people were probably in some senses uh, were, might well have been freer but actually back in the settled settled areas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, in your book, Tribe, you talk about this issue and also the tension uh, in, in our current society of the emotional pull of that feeling that some people get uh, when they're in the military and so on. Why don't you talk a little bit about that background idea, too, because that influences your decision about how you're going to act out your freedoms uh, in our society. Yeah, well, you know, we, you know, we humans spend about 200,000 years in groups, typically in groups of 50 40, 50 people, maybe 100, maybe 200 at the maximum. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the larger the group, the more likely it is to split. And uh, so the st- most stable group size seems to be between 50 and 150 individuals. That's mm-hmm. pretty typical. Um, though That group size is such that you can personally know everyone in the group. Mm-hmm. And you're probably related to a third of them or something, right? Mm-hmm. So... Um, uh, that feels very good, right? The, the sort of lo- the, 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 the loyalty that people feel quite quickly for a group of that size clearly reflects a, in a sort of a, an adaptive behavior. If you have 50 people that are loyal to each other for their safety and for good outcomes for everyone, they're going to just survive better than 50 random people that have no allegiance whatsoever. So, mm. so those, th- those feelings of fraternity and sorority and inclusion and wanting to be you know, wanting to be valued and necessary to your group, like those things make people feel very good. And one of the sort of ironies, I guess, of modern society is that it gives us enormous benefits. It's very wealthy. Um, our rights, our individual rights are more or less guaranteed in a democratic system. Um, our survi- immediate survival needs are sort of outsourced to professionals and, and sort of taken care of for us as long as we you know, work away to eight hour a day and, and pay for these things. Mm-hmm. And uh, so so you, we get these enormous benefits that come from being part of society. But you can't affiliate in a human way with 330 million people mm-hmm. or even 33,000 people or even 3000 people. It's almost impossible. Mm-hmm. And so what you would find, what you find is that when people are, are exposed to small functioning groups where every individual is needed, and that might be a platoon in combat. Um, it might be um, a wilderness, an outdoor wilderness school where a group goes into the wilderness of 20 people goes into the wilderness for a month or two. Mm-hmm. Um, it might be a neighborhood during a disaster like a hurricane. Um, when you expose even modern people, contemporary people to those situations where suddenly they're needed by a small group, uh, often those people uh the people that experience that don't want to let go of it. And I've mm-hmm. talked to people, I know many, many soldiers who really missed the war. Like mm-hmm. they really had, had a hard time giving up life in the platoon that they were in, in combat. And I even know people who survived Hurricane Katrina in, in along the Mississippi coast, the Louisiana coast, who said that they missed it enormously afterwards because all these communities banded together to survive. And one of the things that's distinctive about these situations is that social class disappears Mm -hmm. and suddenly you're valued for what you're willing to do for the group, not for the color of your skin or your income or who your parents were Mm -hmm. or anything like that. You're valued for your, your, your contribution in real time, your contribution to the group. And that's enormously liberating for people that maybe weren't born into wealth or, or feel uh, uh, um, discriminated against or undervalued by Mm -hmm. the society as a whole. You make an interesting point in freedom about friendship. Is that one of the friendship's uh, values is that you you can trust your friend to have your back, but you you if you're, they're not your friend, you can't have that. So are you willing to do it for someone who's not your friend? It was an interesting take on 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 one of the bases for why friendship has become popular. Yeah, well, I mean, friendship um, 
is the is the fabric of of uh, friendship and family is the fabric of human society. Mm. Um, and you know, w- one of the things that's really important to think about is, I mean, to sort of put it crassly, who would you die for mm-hmm. outside of the people in your immediate family? Presumably, if an intruder breaks into your into your home and your three young children are asleep in bed male or female, right? Mom or, or dad, like whoever's home would, most people would absolutely risk or sacrifice their life to defend their children. I mean, mm-hmm. that's just sort of a human norm mm-hmm. uh, for both sexes, I think. And, um, but, uh, but outside of that, like, are, are there people in your community, in your group that you would risk your life for, or even give up dinner for? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> The, the, the sad thing about modern society is that when you ask that question of people, they sort of frown and think they really have to search their minds for who they would do that for. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and in an or small scale or, organic society, because your survival is is com- directly tied to the group. Um, it makes no sense to not risk your life to defend the group because the group is the reason that you have any chance of surviving at all. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, one way to sort of uh, define in your own mind who's in your quote tribe is to, is to basically c- contemplate the idea of what happens to you will happen to me. Mm-hmm. Who do you feel that way about? In other words, if you go hungry, I'll go hungry. If you're in danger, I will share that danger with you and help you get out of it. What happens to you happens to me. And, and sadly in, in modern society, I think there's a real loss here. Um, that you, there may be no one, mm-hmm. there, there may, may be no one that you feel that way about, even people that you're pretty good friends with. Um, and uh, and that, I, that I think is one of the things that makes people feel sort of like disconnected and um, sort of existentially unmoored in their lives. Yeah, it's, uh, we don't have to go back more than 75 uh, years or so to uh, the World War II era when people would help perfect strangers, uh, even though it was at the risk of their own lives, um, to help them escape their, their imminent destruction. Um, and that's, that seems to not be something on anybody's mind right now. Of course, there's not so much imminent destruction going on, at least in our, our territory. You know, there, there are parts of the world where that's still happening. But uh, yeah, how do you react well, to that? I mean, how's that, how is that? Do you think that things have shifted or do you think people would go right back to, to, to behaving that way? Well, I mean, it, what it seems is that as soon as there's a crisis, like the Blitz in London, or mm-hmm. for that matter, I live in New York City, 9-11 in New York, as soon mm-hmm. as there's a crisis, um, people very, very quickly click into that mode. I think on some level, they know that their own survival depend. all of a sudden, their own survival depends on being an accepted and valued member of, of a group, mm-hmm. a survival group. And so, but you're, you're not going to join, you're not going to be able to join that group unless you have something to offer, which is your own willingness to make sacrifices and maybe run risks for the group. And, and again, we don't survive alone. We die. Mm -hmm. You, your survival comes from being part of a group. So if there's a crisis and a threat, uh, a broad threat to the society, it makes enormous sense that people immediately click into this idea of being in service um, because uh, if you're in service to the group, then you're under the protection of the group and, and you have a certain amount of security there. Um, it's a very, not only is it, is it a noble thing, but it's adaptive. Mm-hmm. It has real survival value. And so just as an example, um, 300, well over 300 firemen were lost on 9-11 in New York City. And these guys ran into the world trade centers Mm -hmm. and they were still climbing the stairs when the buildings came down, Mm -hmm. you know, and they were going to save people that they didn't know that they never would have known that, you know, like, and, and uh, in a crisis people's, and of course that's a profession that is dedicated to doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways they do it is they have this vow with each other. What happens to you happens to me. Mm -hmm. If you're, you know, if you're stuck in a, you know, in a built in a collapsed building, we are coming in to get you. Like no matter what, we are going to save you if we possibly can. And that's what I think like what psychologically allows firemen to do their jobs. But I mean, the idea that these guys were doing this for complete strangers in those towers mm-hmm. says a lot about uh, human society. I mean, chimpanzees do not do this. Other mm-hmm. other species do not um, 
only humans will risk their lives or give their lives to to, to save same sex unrelated same sex peers. Mm -hmm. It's unheard of in the mammalian world. Yeah. Now, you, uh, throughout your walk through the wilderness, the story that you tell, you intersperse it with uh, digressions, which uh, are, are always uh, relevant to the nuances of freedom. Uh, one of them that you, you did was you talked about the Scythians um, and, and the fact that the Scythians and the Persians, uh, that, that the Scythians did something that, you know, were, was very upsetting to the Persians in the way that they fought their war. And maybe you can explain, is this related to this? Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, it's a great story. And I think I maybe there's two pronunciations. I know the word is Scythians, but um, so, so the so Darius, uh, what, the Scythians were this sort of wild um, uh, nomadic tribe. They're amazing warriors. They fought on horseback. They're incredible um, archers hmm. and they moved very, very fast. And they, they smoked a lot of marijuana and they didn't comb their hair. And they were just, you know, completely out of out of, out of control in a civilized set from the perspective of civilization, right? And so, <laughs> so the, the Darius, uh, the Persian emperor, uh, moved against them with the greatest army ever assembled. And finally, after chasing the Scythian horsemen for, for like weeks, uh, they, he finally sort of like got them to tur stand, turn and stand and confront him and for this apocalyptic battle. And, um, the, and the Scythians didn't have a chance, right? I mean, Darius's forces were overwhelming. Um, but right before the battle started, you know, this was in an era where armed forces were not half a mile away from each other. They fought, you know, you know, before the battle started, they could, they were looking at each other probably across, across a hundred yards of, of, of underbrush and, and fields and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the Persians, Darius real, noticed that the Scythians, while they were waiting for the battle to start, imagine how nervous these, everyone was right. Waiting for this horrific, uh, episode to start, the Scythians started hunting rabbits in the underbrush with their bows and arrows. And I, I guess on the theory that if they won the battle, they were still going to need to eat dinner. They, they needed something <laughs> to eat for dinner. And the, the, ins, the, the sort of insouciance of the, of the Scythians so unnerved Darius that, that they were so brave that they would do something as casual as hunting rabbits right before this apocalyptic battle, it so unnerved him that he withdrew his forces and did not confront them. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we should have we should have used that tactic in Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, one of the interesting things I would say, I mean, in my book, I, I divide it into three sections: run, fight, and think. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I'm the main thing I'm trying to answer is how is it that only in humans can a smaller combatant or a smaller, uh, a smaller force, a smaller group defeat a larger one? I mean, how is it that humans can maintain their autonomy in the face of a more powerful foe? Mm -hmm. uh, and if that were not possible, uh, I mean, I loathe the Taliban, of course, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been going to Afghanistan since the mid '90s, mm -hmm. uh, when the Taliban were taking over, and I loathe them. But the fact that a a a, a light a, a light fighting force like the Taliban, that don't have any artillery, they don't have any tanks, they don't have an air force, some of them didn't even have boots, that they could outfight the U.S. military over the course of 20 years and get us to withdraw on their terms. The fact that that's even possible in humans uh, means that there's a possibility of freedom. And if the big empire always won, mm -hmm. the world would be a collection of sort of fascist mega states mm -hmm. with ruling elites that ran society to serve their own ends. But that's actually not what the world looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, it, sometimes it does, but that's not uh, ne that's not necessarily um, what human society is. And and so basically, I have this this what I propose in my book, Freedom, is that mobility allows smaller groups to maintain their autonomy. The Apache in the American Southwest mm -hmm. uh, remained autonomous for 300 years when the much wealthier sedentary Pueblo societies got rolled by the Spanish immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and likewise, small groups can outfight larger groups. I looked at mis mixed uh, MMA, mixed martial arts. In the beginning, in the first years of MMA, um, smaller fighters were very capable of defeating much, much larger opponents um, because of a sort of particularity in like how 
how humans fight. And basically, big size and big muscles uses a lot of oxygen. Mm -hmm. And if the big guy doesn't win the fight pretty quickly, pretty quickly, like the U.S. and Afghanistan, if you don't win pretty quickly, you're going to go through so many more resources than the smaller fighter, than the smaller force, mm -hmm. uh, that you just can't sustain it forever. Uh, mm -hmm. And then finally, if within your own society, if you want to maintain your autonomy and, and uh, advocate for your rights, even in a democracy, you have to outthink your opponent. And I looked at the labor movement in America 100 years ago, mm -hmm. um, you know, very completely disempowered groups were actually able to sort of outthink and ultimately defeat politically, legally, defeat the National Guard, the government, corporate interests, you know, really quite effectively. And one that way they did that was incorporating women into their ranks. You know, once mm -hmm. you put women on the front row of a, of, a, of a street protest, the National Guard with fixed bayonets, you know, these young soldiers don't know what to do. They're actually not willing to bayonet women. Mm -hmm. uh, they're much, you know, killing men en masse in the street is much more politically palatable mm -hmm. than women. And so they put women on the front lines. And as one frustrated police chief said in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1912, he said uh, in frustration, he said, uh, uh, one, one good cop can handle 10 men, but it takes 10 cops to handle one woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was what tipped the balance in Lawrence in 1912. Yeah. Do you think that there's a future uh, for um, the female armies as a result? I mean, that, that, well, was, that, was, also an ancient, that was also an ancient idea. It was hard to, 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 to take on the Amazons for the other Greek cultures, too. Yeah. I mean, I know I, it's hard to know where, where myth begins with the Amazons. But I would say in modern, mm -hmm. in modern combat, um, you're, you're, you're generally not. I mean, it's it, it, mass mass warfare is. Um, often conducted at sort of a distance, you know, 100 mm -hmm. yards, 50 yards, 100 yards, 200 meters, 300 meters. Uh, and you're really, you're not using, you know, in a sense, you're not using the particular traits that distinct, often distinguish men from women, right? right. I mean, right. W women, one of the things that makes them very powerful in, a, in an insurgency, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a political movement, is they have lateral networks. Well, you know, men are very good at top-down hierarchies. Mm -hmm. Women are very good at lateral networks, and it's very hard for, for intelligence agencies to penetrate female networks. Mm -hmm. You know, on a modern battlefield with um, uh, automatic weapons uh, and, high, you know, and high explosives, you know, that kind of thing doesn't, doesn't really matter. I, yeah. I don't think it really matters if you have a man or a woman behind an M240 machine gun in combat. Um, and, and the amount of weight that, the, that this weaponry, I mean, the amount of weight that a modern infantry soldier has to carry is so huge. Um, 100, 120 pounds, 140 pounds sometimes sort of depends. Um, you know, you, it's hard, to, you know, hard, you know, hard for anyone even over age 30 to carry that kind of weight. And just because women are generally smaller framed, have less muscle mass than men, um, there are fewer women that are going to be able to carry that weight than, than even men can carry that weight. So, you know, I, there's a lot of things going into the equation of women in combat uh, beyond just pulling a trigger. Yeah, another part of modern warfare is uh, the use of drones, where people don't even have to be there. They can, they can be managing it from the Las Vegas desert or something like that, even though it's over in Afghanistan. Um, but that didn't win either. Um, yeah. that, didn't, that didn't win the day either. And so um, it's kind of weird to use million dollar weapons um, and, and not get anywhere with them or, or, or have the destruction of something worth $50 and stuff. So, so yeah. yeah. And I, 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 I don't know about you. I mean, you were there in Afghanistan. I think one of the questions that I always have from this use of drones is it, I, I would think it would seem unmanly uh, to the, the people that are fighting us that we use these drones and don't send in people to fight them. Um, and it, it probably reminds them of the movies where the aliens come and they send in, you know, uh, th this high tech stuff to fight them. Yeah, I mean, look, we send in plenty of people to fight them, too. I mean, yeah. we took a lot of casualties in Afghanistan and the Afghans were very good fighters and so were the Americans and they went at it. You know, the, the drones, I mean, the drones are no more unfair than a 155 battery 12 miles away, you know, dropping a howitzer round within, you know, five meters or whatever of, uh, you know, of the target. Mm -hmm. I mean, that comes out of nowhere also. I mean, bombs dropped from 30,000 feet also come out of nowhere. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of weaponry that seems to come out of nowhere. I mean, the thing about drones is that you have, the, the operator has eyes on the target. And if they see civilians walk onto the scene at the last moment, they can actually 
sort of call off the strike mm-hmm. um, within a much closer time frame than a howitzer round or a bomb drop from 40,000 feet. So I, I don't think the Taliban were really, I mean, I'm not sure that they were making those distinctions necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think they liked the drones, but they didn't like the howitzers either. I mean, why mm-hmm. would they, you know, yeah. and on the other, you know, and, the, and they had weapons also, right? I mean, they had uh, improvised explosives and, uh, you know, car bombs and all kinds of things that seemed unfair to the Americans, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you know, basically unfair means if my skills as a, as, a, as a warrior, as a fighter, don't help me survive, that's an unfair weapon. Mm-hmm. So if you just bury bombs in the road and you blow us up randomly, that's unfair. And then the Taliban, I'm sure, are like, OK, but you're bombing us from 40,000 feet. Mm-hmm. That's also unfair. And they're both right. Right. So um, let's get back to some of the ideas about the freedom that you that you talked about. Um, you, you told other stories in the book, other other digressions for this nuance. And it seems, you know, I mean, our society has to kind of decide between the chaos on the one hand, which almost nobody can tolerate, and you know the authoritarian megastructure, fascist states that you're talking about. And if you go back, say, 600 years or so, there were maybe five really big empires that maybe controlled one third, one half of the population, something like that. But then there was a period of time when that broke down, you know, and and democracy came in. I mean, we, we don't really have a lot of democracy in our democracy, but it's a lot more than having. Uh, an authoritarian state. So what's your what's your confidence level that that form of government, um, not not so authoritarian, has a future? Um, not not talking about the next 10 years, but talking about the next yeah. century or two. Well, you know, what's interesting about democracies is they is that they there's this basic problem that humans have to solve. They have to have a society that's robust enough and, mm-hmm. and well armed enough and well organized enough to defend an enemy that wants to kill or enslave you, um, which is a real threat to human freedom and has been mm. for thousands and thousands of years. Um, I mean, just for example, I looked at the, at the Yamnaya, which were a nomadic horse culture on the eastern steppe, on the Russian steppe, mm-hmm. uh, that fought from horse-drawn chariots 5,000 years ago when the horse was sort of new to human society. And they traveled in all male groups. Uh, they loved fighting. And they were sort of the first motorcycle gang in some ways. And they, <laughs> they, they, they carved their way through Europe and, and invaded the Iberian Peninsula. And we know from genetic studies that within about 100 years, 5,000 years ago, over the course of about 100 years, the Yamnaya eradicated all of the men in Iberia, in the Iberian Peninsula, and clearly made it with the women. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Iberian men were not able to defend their freedom, their autonomy, uh, their, their, their society from the Yamnaya. So if you can't repel an invader, you're not going to be free or alive for very long. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the problem is, if you're martial enough to, to repel the Yamnaya, um, you also potentially have a fighting force that a, a corrupt, self-interested ruler could use to oppress his own people, mm-hmm. right? So how do you maintain a fair society that can also defend itself? And democracy is one of the answers to that. Mm-hmm. Um, in, a, in a democracy, rulers are not exempt from the nation's laws. I mean, the framers were very, very clear about that. Unlike the kings and queens of Europe back uh, you know, in the 1700s, mm-hmm. uh, who basically could do no wrong, right? They could kill and rape and pillage and murder as much as they wanted. There was no redress mm-hmm. by, the, by the populace. Uh, but the framers produced documents that clearly made the, the, them, they themselves and any future rulers, leaders, not rulers, but leaders in America, accountable to the same laws that, that, that governed the, the, the populace. And that was, a, that was a huge innovation that basically circles back to our evolutionary past when we lived in small groups of hunter-gatherers where, where, where leaders actually could not impose their will on everyone else. They were subject to the same morality, the same, the same rules. Um, so, so as a result, partly as a result, um, democracies are quite stable. They're associated with robust economies, uh, with, with great wealth. Um, they are associated with peaceful transfers of power year after year after year. Mm -hmm. Um, they're associated with global dominance and technological innovation. I mean, they're associated with an awful lot of good things. 
And so, uh, you know, I would and, and dictatorships, on the other hand, my father grew up in Spain. Uh, he was born in Germany. He, mm-hmm. His father was Jewish. So they was born in Germany. They, le- they left in 1933, I think, uh, when the Nazi party started taking over. They went to Spain. They left again when the fascists took, took over in Spain. Uh, they went to France and they left France when the Germans came into France. Well, all of the fascist regimes of Europe that, you know, these guys were obsessed with control, right? Mm-hmm. All of the, ironically, all of those fascist regime, regimes collapsed fairly quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's enduring are de- democratic regimes, authoritarian regimes that really don't tend to, to be passed from father to son or from ruler to ruler um, very easily. They, they, they really don't do well over the course of decades and centuries. So I, I can't see the future I think there's an enormous threat to American democracy right now within the democratic system. Um, January 6th of last year, I think, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, earlier in this year, uh, I think shows you um, what that threat can look like. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going to happen. I, I have high hopes for, for the country. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, of course, I can't know what's going to happen here. Yeah. Um, so in, in approaching freedom, you know, uh, in, in your own life as an individual in a society, you know, where on the spectrum do you feel most comfortable in terms of the freedom? Obviously, you have lived a relatively dangerous life. Um, you have gone out, you've done all kinds of uh, adventures and written about them extremely well. Um, so you have, you have pushed the amount of freedom that most people would have. Um, but but where where do you see yourself in that spectrum versus from authoritarianism to chaos chaos? Well, I mean, I, the, there's different ways of defining freedom. One mm. one very important one is economic freedom. If you mm. have enough money to insulate yourself from threats to your own survival, um, that's a form of freedom. Mm. Um, on the other hand, in order to amass enough money to do that, people often have to work very hard. Mm-hmm. And so you lose tempor- t- temporal freedom. Um, you know, there's homeless guys I've talked to who were as free as could be, right? I mean, they, mm-hmm. no one owned their day. Mm-hmm. They didn't have any money. They lived, you know, hand to mouth or whatever, but no one was telling them what to do all day long, unlike most people who have jobs and bosses. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think modern democracies have sort of solved the, in a fa- fairly well solved the sort of like, the 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 balance of security, you know, so security from an enemy and a fairly, you know, somewhat at least somewhat fair internal system, internal society, but mm-hmm. not completely. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of injustice in our society, um, and you know, but ultimately, the ultimate freedom, of course, might be internal. I talked to a guy, mm-hmm. I talked to a man who um, served 25 years, 25 years or so in prison for committing murder. You know, he was from a very low income neighborhood. He was a very underprivileged youth. Mm -hmm. Uh, His life took a bad turn. He got into drugs and he committed an unthinkable act and paid for it as he should have. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he educated himself in prison. He was a brilliant man, is a brilliant man. Uh, He found God. Uh, He really sort of reformed himself in prison. And I interviewed him about two weeks after he was released on good behavior. And uh I, I asked him I, at the end of our conversation, I said, you know, I, I feel silly asking this, but is it possible to be more free in prison than outside of prison? And he looked at me like I was a fool. He said, oh, of course it is. Mm-hmm. You can't be a drug addict in prison, for example. Mm-hmm. You can't even be distracted by your iPhone like mm-hmm. most people are. They're mm-hmm. not free. Those people on their iPhones walking down the street, just completely obsessed with their phones. They're not free. In a lot of ways, they're addicted to their phones. Mm-hmm. Addiction is not freedom. And he and he said, you know, if you're in prison, you got nothing but time. And eventually, eventually you're going to have an honest conversation with yourself about who you really are and why you're in there. And mm-hmm. when you do that, you're a free man. And that's a level of freedom that a lot of people on the outside never achieve. So it's interesting. There's a there's a novel by Jack London called The Star Over, where he uh, I think in the 1910s or so he wrote it. And it was about a guy who was put in prison um, and that he. He developed a, a, a mental freedom. He was tortured by the by the um, by the warden and everything, 
um, because he didn't cooperate. And so he was always in solitary confinement. But the basic story is that he, he creates more freedom for himself in his mind than he had right. even before he was in prison. So that psychological freedom is, a, is a, uh, another element of what you're talking about, as you said. Uh, I, one of the things for psychological freedom, a, a definition of freedom is that you agree with yourself about what you want. You know, you, you don't, right. You're not conflicted inside your own mind about what you want to do with your life. And so right. and it doesn't matter what it is that, that you want as long as you don't disagree with yourself. Yeah. And, you know, uh, as they say in AA, you're, you're only you're only as healthy as your secrets. I mean, you could you could argue you're only as free as your secrets, too. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in conflict about what you want, you you're less likely to have secrets. And if you're and if you don't have secrets, then you avoid that horrible sort of like uh, cycle of of shame and remorse and bad behavior that drives mm -hmm. addicts of all of all of all sorts. Mm -hmm. um, and uh you know, and I know I know people who are recovering alcoholics who have struggled with drug addicts. I mean, you know, it's a terrible thing and it strips people of their freedom. One of my um, criticisms of social media uh, and particularly iPhones, which just make all of that stuff, you know, too available in your front pocket all the time, mm. uh, is that, you know, very, very clearly the people people exhibit highly addictive behavior around social media. I mean, the behaviors around social media are clearly a form of addiction and a real diminishment of our of all of our freedom. On that topic, very interesting. So do you think that there's something that can be done about the the, the um, what would mostly in most centuries be called a monopoly uh, business that is the social media businesses? Because we know exactly that they know what they're doing and, and making sure that it's addictive. Um, do you think that there's any kind of regulatory thing that a de democratic government can do to, to shift that and make it uh, less available? Yeah, I mean, in, you know, in the sense of addictive. Well, I, you know, I don't I'm not sure. I'm not a lawyer, of course. Mm -hmm. And but I think I'm guessing that if you can demonstrate uh, if you can demonstrate harm to, to the society, I mean, if a corporation dumps mercury in the drinking water mm -hmm. and it and and it, it kills um, and it kills people. If you can demonstrate that harm, the corporation owes compensation to those people and to society broadly, and they have to correct their behavior. Hmm. And I, you know, I think what you'd have to do, and I'm, you know, the data is coming out now. I mean, what was, Facebook started, what was it? 2012, something like that. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact year, but what, and, you know, a correlation is not causation. I mean, I know that, but, the the depression and anxiety and suicide rates for young for young people for teens particularly teenage girls mm -hmm. skyrocketed after that mm -hmm. and you know it seems pretty clear that these these sort of obsessive and addictive behavior around and the self examination that happens around use of social media um, uh, can be really toxic and damaging to young people and you know I, I, I think there's a I think there's a real argument I mean I think you can make a real case for the fact that social media companies owe our society some kind of redress, some some kind of protective action. Uh, I mean, Facebook is wrestling with this right now with Instagram, of course. They know. I mean, internal mem memos have shown mm -hmm. uh, that Instagram is is can be really quite dangerous, particularly for young girls. And they and 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 and, and they and these companies know that. Right. So. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh, you know, what what do they owe us as a society? What kind of protections do they owe us? I don't know. I hope it's a lot. Mm -hmm. They've made a huge amount of money off us. Um, I think they owe some of it back to protect their own people. I mean, that's what any good tribal member would do. Yeah, that's well, well put. And uh, it's interesting because, uh, you know, China is trying to put restrictions on the use of, of uh, the Internet. Uh, right now. I mean, that's one of the things that they decided on. And of course, the first reaction is uh, that's uh, fascist behavior. But at the same time, um, if you go back 60, 70 years, uh, when religious institutions had a bigger impact, I mean, uh, gambling was not allowed, you know, Dor divorce was not allowed. These, these things were, you know, freedoms yeah. uh, that we, we have. And, and the whole question in a secular democratic society is, what reasons do you use to say, where do we draw the line, you know, to say, we, we need more more restrictions versus more freedom or how do we how do we because that's exactly you know I mean your book is all about those nuances and and they're, they'd yeah. be useful in this area. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, I don't know how you'd adjudicate that, and no. I'm sure it would wind up in the courts. But um, uh, I mean, it's I think it's pretty clear. It's intuitively clear that incredibly powerful corporations, it's immoral and illegal to for them to um, enrich themselves at the cost of other people's lives. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just intuitively obvious. Uh, and society, it's society, government imposes restrictions all the time. We are not free to drive on the left-hand side of the road in the United States. We're just mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we have a, a free society in a democratic sense, but that doesn't mean you can do anything you want if you put the public at risk. Mm -hmm. You're not free to run a red light. I mean, government restricts people's actions all the time. It doesn't mean it's an abridgment of their freedom. <laughs> Um, before we run out of time, there's a few questions and I would like to, uh, to, to ask, and I'm not at all surprised that the first question is about Daisy. Uh, is Daisy still alive and, and, and uh, do you have dogs now? Uh, unfortunately, Daisy passed away at the age of 13 a couple of years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And in, in, in my book, Freedom, I, I, I say at one point, I remember I was falling asleep Daisy always slept like right next to, I mean, we all slept in a group on the ground and Daisy was always right next to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she, uh, I, I was sort of drifting off and I was thinking, you know, God's, I'm an atheist, but figuratively speaking, God's, mm -hmm. God's great oversight was that he didn't make dogs live as long as men. Yeah. Uh, and imagine the relationship you could have with a dog as you would with a partner, mm -hmm. you know, if dogs lived the same, had, had a human lifespan, you know, it'd be an extraordinary thing. And, and so it's a huge regret. I don't have dogs right now. It's a huge regret for me, a real sorrow that she passed away. It's interesting that the internet has shown uh, exactly how much interest there is in, in, in animals because they, they, the attention given to other people's animals and the antics of animals and, and also the, the, the proliferation of, of videos about animals being nice to each other across species, for example, I think yeah. gives people hope, that kind of thing, is, and, and, and lets people see animals in a different way that don't really know them, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's uh, an right. interesting positive element of that um, availability. Um, here's a question from uh, G. Sanborn. Uh, Sebastian, given all the time you spent in Afghanistan, how are you and your friends in the military dealing with the U.S. departure from Afghanistan and the plight of our local allies? Oh, well, thanks for the question. Yeah, I think it was a very painful moment for a lot of people. I mean, I think abstractly, everyone knew we were going to leave Afghanistan eventually. Uh, 20 years is a long time. We lost thousands of lives. Uh, the Afghans lost tens of thousands, maybe 100,000, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the Taliban are a horrific regime. And I, you know, I, I think it was pretty traumatic for people to watch that happen. Um, but, you know, time, time heals wounds. You know, I don't hear them talking about it as much right now. Uh, and I think there's a very important ongoing issue of continuing to get our Afghan allies, people who are at risk, mm -hmm. who, 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 work, who work for the U.S. military and for our endeavor over there, you get them and their families safely out of that country. Um, I think it's a hugely important thing. Yeah, it's a... a a shame because we think of the United States as always honoring those commitments, but uh, we've, we've certainly done it uh, with the Kurds in the past and uh, a couple of times. And uh, I was reading something in American history from, uh, you know, the, the American Indians and how we dealt with them. We did almost the same thing. We'd make allies and then we would, you know, uh, just forget about what we had said. Um, so here's another question from Arnav Gupta. He says, how do we make companies like Facebook, Uber, social media apps take responsibility for the secondary mental health impacts? their loosely policed platforms are causing. You were talking about that a little bit earlier, but maybe, I mean, do you have any ideas about, you said about giving some of the wealth, wealth that they earned back. Is there some projects that you, you think uh, might be helpful? Well, I, I don't know, but I mean, the problem with social media isn't that it's inherently bad. It's that it takes the place of face-to-face -face human interactions. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I think what concerns us all and should concern these companies companies very, very deeply just because they're part of society, an important part of society. What concerns us all is that human uh, human community, the, the sense of community in this country is disintegrating. Um, hum, humans need community. We People need to feel like they're part of something, uh, something local and mm -hmm. human scaled, uh, where they're a meaningful part. They, 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 they can draw on, on, on the support of others and they can 
in turn give back to the community. Mm-hmm. And and I you know I don't know how you do that in a modern society, but if I were an immensely wealthy owner of a social media company, I would dedicate a huge amount of money to figuring out how we can change our educational our education system, how we can change our architecture, our urban planning, um, change everything about the society to make it more community oriented, because that's what will buffer people from uh, from anxiety and depression and suicidal impulses and addiction. I mean, we're the wealthiest society ever, right? And we have the highest rates of suicide and depression and addiction ever. Like, mm-hmm. just think about that. Like, how could that possibly be? Mm-hmm. I think these social media companies are in an excellent position to do a kind of moonshot, except a moonshot that is focused on returning the sense of community to individual people of all income levels in this amazing country that we live in. I think that's a great idea to, to end on. Um, there's uh, hope from my point of view about this. I mean, we're using digital uh, information to be able to communicate with lots of people now. Uh, the Commonwealth Club obviously is a, a place where people would come together in live audiences and the pandemic has gotten in the way of that. But as you said in your book, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's because you, you, you're, you're working with the society and everyone's cooperating and people feel their fr- freedom is infringed upon. Uh, when they're masks, you know, when they have to wear masks, or they have, you know, they should take the vaccine. But this is something that you, you want, want to tell you a little bit about that before we, we finish, because that was one of your points that I thought was very useful. Um, that this is this is an infringement of freedom. I mean, you, you, yeah. I mean, uh, society has the right to protect itself, mm-hmm. uh, to protect the group. And the great thing about a democracy is that if you don't like the restrictions, the regulations, the strictures that society comes up with, you're free to challenge them in court. There's recourse, you can go to court. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, you can vote the bastards out. If you think we should all be driving on the left-hand side of the road, go for it, bring Mm -hmm. it up before, bring it to the courts, Mm -hmm. right? If you lose, you lose. The one thing you cannot do in a democracy is is resort to violence Mm -hmm. um, to, to produce an outcome that actually makes it not a democracy when you do that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if some, you know, gen- different generations are going to be called upon to serve their nation, right? I mean, 60, 70 years ago, a generation was called upon to storm the beaches of Normandy to defeat fascism in Europe, right? And mm-hmm. and the, the, the advanced units that, that stormed the beaches of Normandy, I think their casualty rates were on the order of 90%, mm-hmm. right? And their yeah. nation needed them. Our, our nation needs us to sometimes wear masks and mm-hmm. get a vac- vaccination. I mean, I, you know, for me, it, 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 it felt like a rare opportunity to, f- to feel part of, like I'm part of something greater. Mm-hmm. If you want other ways to feel part of something greater, there's three easy ways to do it. And it's important to feel like you're part of your country, right? But there's three easy ways to do that. Give blood. My life was saved a year and a half ago uh, from an internal hemorrhage. Uh, they came out of the blue. I lost 90 percent of my blood and my life was saved by by 10 people who donate 10 anonymous people who donated blood. And my life was saved. Give blood. Uh, uh, serve on jury duty. Jury duty uh, means that one individual person cannot decide the fate of another person, not not a judge, not a sheriff, not a president. Nobody. Jury duty is what keeps us from tyranny. And finally, vote. Every single person in this country should be voting. Your nation needs you to vote. And when you when you vote, you feel like you're part of this nation. It's an intoxicating feeling. If you do those three things, uh, not only will you save this country, I'm guessing that you will save yourself as well. That's perfect advice. And, and if you're worried about, you know, the whole world going digital and that human interaction will come to an end, just remember that in spite of television and movies and TV, Live theater still thrives um, and because people cannot miss the live theater. Still, musical performances are alive. It's always the height of, of any of those experiences. We can have something that's 70% is good by digital or something, but we're going to always want the height of, of, of all those things where we actually see the people live and in person next time for your next book. Hopefully the pandemic will be done and you'll be able to be here live in San Francisco. I really appreciate your joining us today. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Um, um, Thank you very much for having me. Our pleasure. And so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its 119th year of enlightened discussion. Come and join us again. Thanks a lot for joining us this time. Thanks, Sebastian. That was wonderful. 
Thank you so much. 